Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, third of uh, our communion preparation sermons and services. Uh, let me encourage you to be thinking along those lines that these are, these are services that are meant to uh, help you to prepare for coming to the Lord's table uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, one thing that we know uh, unambiguously is, is that we are to be prepared. Uh, we're not to partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, and uh, to avoid doing that, it uh, requires some forethought and um, some spiritual uh, preparation. And we certainly have been treated to a feast for our souls uh, the last two nights uh, with Dr. Davis's uh, preaching. And we're very grateful for uh, your ministry uh, among us and your insights into the covenant and the covenant ceremony in Genesis 15. Um, and then tying that into Galatians 3 and Christ becoming a curse for us, all very illuminating uh, and very in inspiring uh, for us. Uh, his books uh, are in the, in the Fellowship Hall. Um, there's a book table there. If you would like uh, to purchase one of those and, and uh, use that in your own personal Bible study. This is a covenantal meal in which we will be participating Sunday. In covenant meals, covenants are reconfirmed, they are ratified, they are, um, they are, um, uh, we, we confess again our commitment to Christ and Christ uh, is portraying his commitment to us. And his promises are being represented by the bread and, and the cup and his assurances and as uh, Dr. Davis said last night, we, we are people who need reassuring. How, do, how can we know uh, that uh, these things are so? So the Lord's Supper is there as a reassurance. Uh, it is a, a confirmation of the promises that are given to us in Christ. So we have this regular reminder, this regular confirmation, this regular reassurance of of the promises of God, the promises of the forgiveness of our sins, the promise of uh, reconciliation with God, the promise of the gift of eternal life, uh, that the promise that uh, when we die, yet we will live. So uh, use the services uh, uh, for that, uh, to that end, uh, the message tonight, and then we will gather at nine o'clock and 11 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, for uh, the ministry of the table. So let's join uh, together in prayer. Our, our Father in heaven, we, we come to praise and to, to honor you. We bow before you. You are worthy of our praise and honor. Uh, for you are a holy God. Uh, before you, the heavenly choirs cry out ceaselessly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of your glory. Your eyes, O oh, oh Lord, are pure, too pure even to look upon evil. You are, you are a God who is light and in whom there is no darkness at all. Uh, so we praise you, O oh Lord, for you are a holy God. Uh, you are righteous and just in all your ways, uh, you are perfect in holiness, fearful in praises, uh, one who does wonders. Uh, we come to you, our Father, in Jesus' name. He's the mediator of the new covenant. We come to you, the new and the living way that he has established by his blood. We pray in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of our sins and the, the removal of whatever might obstruct our benefiting from the ministry of the Word tonight, and, and uh, we pray that you would purge our hearts of our, of our sin and uh, remove any barriers to belief. Uh, soften our hearts. Make us receptive, O oh Lord. Give us the ears to hear uh, your Word uh, this evening. 
uh, be honored and, and praised and glorified by all that transpires here. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Christ has made the sure foundation is the hymn with which we open. Uh, according uh, to, the, to the notes at the bottom of the hymn, it dates all the way back to the seventh century. John Mason Neal uh, played a major role in the first Anglican hymnal, the Hymns Ancient and Modern of 1861. And one of the features of that hymnal was, was uh, hymns uh, that, uh, that dated back to the ancient and medieval church, which he translated and included in that collection. And this is one of those. Uh, Christians have been praising God to, with language like this for a very, very long time. Christ has made the sure foundation. Our scripture this evening comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 50, and verses 4 through 11. This evening we're thinking about the needed servant. First time we looked at our, we needed to know our own condition, that was Jericho grace. And we needed to be sure of God, that was Genesis 15. And now tonight we look at the provision that God has made for us in the needed servant. Now, I think we should just say this is called uh, sometimes the third servant song in Isaiah. In the chapters of Isaiah, there's a, in chapter 42, verses 1 to 4, then in 49, 1 to 13, 
then in chapter 50, verses 4 to 11, and then in chapter, the end of chapter 52 and chapter 53, there are these four, as they're sometimes called, servant songs that speak of the, I think, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. Uh, this is the third of those servant songs. So we join the text where the servant himself is speaking. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. The Lord Yahweh has given me a disciple's tongue to know how to support the weary with a word. He awakens morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as disciples do. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear, and I, I did not rebel. I did not turn away. I gave my back to smiters and my cheeks to ones plucking out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spit. But the Lord Yahweh helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face as a flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. My justifier is close by. Who dares bring a charge against me? Let us stand up in court together. Who is my prosecutor? Let him draw near to me. Oh, yes, the Lord Yahweh helps me. Who is the one who would declare me guilty? Surely all of them will wear out like a garment. A moth will eat them up. Who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant who has walked in darkness with no glimmer of light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and let him lean upon his God. Now, all of you who strike fire, who gird yourselves with burning darts, walk on into the flame of your fire and among the darts you have ignited. This is what you will get from me you will lie down in a place of pain. Uh, we'll sing now the 22nd Psalm, uh, verses 1 through 8. Uh, you have that printed in your bulletin, this uh, psalm that begins with this terrible, terrible cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? First written by David, uh, Jesus takes these words, um, uh, makes them his own in the 22nd Psalm, as indeed they increasingly, as we progress through the Psalm, uh, des describing the terrible suffering of Christ. Uh, so we will sing through uh, verse 8, which includes in verses 7 and 8, some of the taunting that he endured on the cross. Uh, all this is further preparation for the Lord's table tomorrow. Psalm 22, one through eight. Mm -hmm. 
I still remember the day when uh, in ninth grade I had to have a physical for basketball season when it was coming up and my father took me to the doctor and uh, after the examination was over Dr. Vincent said well he's all right he's just quote he's just pooped out and uh, so he gave me a whole batch of these huge iron capsules that I was to take uh, and that's how it is sometimes with the faith of God's people. They're not blown away, they're just worn down. And if that weariness and exhaustion becomes extreme, they can, in despair, even imagine that God has cast them aside. Now, in the prophecy of Isaiah, and I just, we just have to rub our noses in this a little bit, I think, in the prophecy of Isaiah, there's the second servant song in chapter 49, verses 1 to 13. Uh, and in that second servant song in, in Isaiah 49, the Lord promises to use his servant to restore Jacob to himself. And he also promises they will never hunger or thirst and that he will show compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion, God's people, will have none of that. Because in chapter 49, verse 14, it says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. That was the attitude of the people of God, apparently. It's as if they were saying, that's all very good and beautifully said, but God has cast us off. We can never, He can never give us music and mercy again. And then what happens? Well, every section of text from chapter 49, verse 14 on, Chapter 49, verse 14 is important because it's the despair of God's people. And every section of text from that verse on, clear through chapter 52, verse 12, forms part of Yahweh's answer to that despair. It depends how you divide up the text. As I look at it, there are 13 sections of text from 49 verse 15 through chapter 52, 12. So what you have there is 13 sections of a word from the God of all comfort, comforting Zion in all her afflictions, one verse of spiritual depression, 49, 14, sets off almost four chapters of the balm of Gilead. Now, this third servant song, chapter 50, verses 4 to 11, which we're looking at tonight, this third servant song is a part of that glob of material in which Yahweh pummels his people with assurance as he stirs up hope and provides encouragement and corrects wrong thinking. It begins suddenly, doesn't it, with someone speaking in the first person, I, my, me, and so on. The form of this text in chapter 50 in verses 4 to 11 is that in verses 4 to 9 you have the song proper, and in verses 10 and 11 you have footnotes to that song. We'll talk about that in a moment or six. Uh, now, it begins very suddenly, and I want you to look here at what Isaiah provides of the pictures of this one called the servant, and see how he is suited not just to Israel's, but to our weariness. What are these pictures of the servant? Well, first of all, he is the disciple skilled in God's Word, verse 4. The disciple skilled in God's Word. The Lord Yahweh has given me a disciple's tongue to know how to support the weary with a word. He awakens morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as disciples do. This servant is going to be a speaker of the Word. Now, it's a skillful word. 
He says, he's given me a disciple's tongue, or literally the tongue of disciples. A disciple is one who learns, who is taught, and so is skilled. But you don't get the tongue of a disciple unless you have the ear of a disciple. Do you pick that up there? He's given me a disciple's tongue, etc., but he wakens morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear as disciples do, because the servant hears the Lord's word. Then he has the disciple's tongue. It's a skillful word, but it's also a necessary word. You notice He's given me a disciple's tongue to know how to support the weary with a word. Now, I don't know if if you've thought about that. I think in your own experience, in your own Christian experience, you know that there's there's a sense in which God's word supports you in your weariness. But it's an evolved, it's a in one say way, it's a it's an amazing assumption, isn't it? that a word, a mere word, would support the weary, that somehow a mere word could encourage, etc., and hold up. Here are people who may be hanging on by their fingernails, and, and the support to endure comes simply from a word. Well, but if I can uh, go back to one of the... Uh, James Robertson's uh, records of uh, some of the correspondence that took place during the war between the states and some of the, some of the men in arms, both in the Confederate and the, and the Federal Army. There was one fellow who was a Minnesota private, and he once exclaimed, I can live a month now without eating. I have got five letters from my dear wife. Well, he knows what that's like. There's a sense in which the encouragement from a word sustains, and and we tend to know that. It just seems unusual, perhaps. And it's not just a necessary word needed by the weary, but it's also a fresh word. Do you see that? He awakens morning by morning. It's not a stale word. It's not a trite word. But this word that sustains the servant's people is a word that's fresh. He awakens morning by morning. It's a fresh word, you might say, for a new need. There's a sort of a vitality here. It's as if the word has the dew of heaven still on it. Now, some words can be very trite and and stale. I remember one time when I was working as a college student Uh, And in the summers, I was working at one of the Pennsylvania state parks. My job was an evening job, and uh, I would check campers into the park. They would want to rent a space for the night or maybe more than one night. My job was to check them in, write or retake their money and write a receipt. It was a very nominal fee for a campsite, especially a tent site. But these people would come in, and I was to ask them the very first question, do you have any pets? Because pets were not allowed. And so the first thing I was to do, if they answered correctly, was to put NP with a circle around it at the very top of the receipt I wrote. Uh, So I would ask them the question, so do you have any pets? And and some fellow would come in and so on, and he would kind of smirk, and he would would kind of go up, you know, on his toes like some men do when they sing a hymn in church and all that sort of thing. He'd say, well, just my wife. (laughs) And then he would chuckle as if this was some original bit of humor. What he didn't know is that I'd probably heard that very same thing 17 times before that week, and it wasn't anything that was funny. Sometimes there's a stale word, but the word of the servant is not a stale word. It awakens morning by morning to give a fresh word for a new need, and God's people know what that's like. It was in uh, October of 1864, Andrew Bonar, who was the Scottish pastor, um, 
uh, talked about what a wound he had received. He said, last night, October 14th, 5th, 6th, 5th, 1864, uh, his wife was suddenly, after three hours sinking, taken from me, he says. His wife, Isabella, married 17 years, and she died apparently maybe from complications after childbirth, I'm not sure. Bonar says later in his entry about that day, he said, I had been reading between dinner and tea my usual verse, Nahum 1-7 was that for the day. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. And then he said, little did I know how much I would need that word half an hour later, but that was a word to sustain the weary in face of a need. Or there was a time when Martin Lloyd-Jones was pastor in Westminster Chapel, London. It was in 1949. He'd been there at least 10 years, and, and uh, he, he was... Uh, physically exhausted, and he was apparently somewhat depressed, and he went to Wales to recuperate in that summer. Uh, and uh, there were some other troubles going on, and he was kind of overwhelmed. And then near the end of that summer, come September, he was to go back to Westminster Chapel and resume his ministry. And he went to do that, and he got back about the second Sunday of September, and, and he had been thinking and, and on, a, on a sermon and so on, and nothing was coming. Uh, he was distraught. It was Saturday afternoon before the Sunday he was to preach, and he just felt he couldn't preach. All the trouble seemed to come uh, barreling in on him again, and, and nothing would develop, and so on. And, and, and he wondered if, if he could go on. And, and then in the midst of that despair, there shot into his mind a phrase from Titus 1, verse 2. God, who cannot lie. You remember the clause where, where Paul says, eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised us long ages ago. But just that assurance, God, who cannot lie, somehow burst in and sustained him. He says he was utterly overwhelmed in tears, and the sermon was given to him there and then. But it was a fresh word in the face of a need. That's the sort of thing the Lord ministers to us. And that is the servant. He is the disciple skilled in God's Word. And there's a little overflow for us, isn't there, in this? Because this is telling us that we who are the servants' servants may find the same principle operating for us. If we want to have the tongue of a disciple, we need to have the ear of a disciple and listen to our Lord's Word, as it were, morning by morning if we want to support the weary with the Word. So that's a disciple skilled in God's Word. The second picture that Isaiah gives us of the servant is the sufferer submissive to God's will, verses 5 and 6. The sufferer submissive to God's will. Now, when um, in verse 5 there, there's uh, an emphatic, two emphatic uh, clauses. The first is, the term the Lord Yahweh is emphatic. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear. That is, He has made me, caused me to be obedient. And then the uh, I, the first I is emphatic. And I, I did not rebel. Now, you notice you can observe several things here in verses 5 and 6 as it talks about the servant's suffering. For one thing, the, the suffering was God's will for His servant. 
The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear. He's caused me to be submissive and obedient. It was His will, this suffering for His servant. And a second thing is that the servant was submissive to that suffering willed for him. He says, I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to those plucking out my beard. I was submissive to that. And then there's a third matter here. You can observe that the suffering is shameful and intense. Notice he says, I gave my back, my cheeks, and my face I did not hide from scorn and spit. So this, this suffering is shameful and intense and yet mysterious. We don't have any rationale for this suffering here. We don't know why it was. Now, when you get to the fourth servant song and the end of chapter 52 and all of chapter 53, you'll get an answer, as it were, to that question to, to kind of fill out why it was the servant suffered. But right here in chapter 50, we don't have that answer. We just know the suffering was intense and shameful, but it's still mysterious. The rationale is not precisely spelled out. Now, as you look at verse 6, that remarkable language there, you doubtless see a forecast of Jesus' sufferings, and I think rightly so. But don't jump on your horse and go galloping to Mark 15 or John 19 too quickly. Remember, this is Isaiah's word communicated in the 700s B.C. to the people of Judah. What does this word, what would this word have to say to them before we go to the New Testament? Well, just this. This text tells them that Yahweh's servant was not merely a minister to the weary and suffering, but himself was weary and suffered. He's not simply one who knows our distress from the outside, but one who has entered into it on the inside. And his experience of suffering then adds weight to that ministry of the Word in verse 4. Have you ever noticed how that can be? I remember back in uh, probably the mid-1980s, we were living and had a pastor in Westminster, Maryland. And uh, I think it was the local Young Life uh, chapter sponsored... Um, a uh, presentation by Johnny Erickson Tata. They had her there. They uh, rented the high school auditorium, and here this large auditorium was packed, and uh, Johnny uh, uh, came out and she spoke. Um, and she spoke on the sovereignty of God about how God is in control and is master of all and things like he doesn't make mistakes and so on. Now, anyone can teach or preach and speak of the sovereignty of God, and we have texts and we have preached on it and so on and so forth. But there's something a little bit gripping, isn't there? When you have a paraplegic sitting in her wheelchair on a stage, and she talks out of that condition about the sovereignty of God. It, it, it has some clout to it. And that's what you see here. This, this one who is the disciple, who, who speaks a word to the weary, he, he himself has been weary and suffered. That gives weight to that word. He understands his people. Now, there's more here. Let me draw your attention uh, to the footnote section of our text, verses 10 and 11. Now, in these two verses, I want you to especially look at verse 10, but these two verses speak to two different conditions of people in the nation of Judah. Verse 10 speaks to believers. Verse 11 speaks to those who are involved in pagan rites, and have basically turned their back on the faith. 
So verse 10 speaks to believers, verse 11 speaks to apostates and expresses God's judgment on them. So I want you to look here, though, at verse 10 particularly, and here I'm, we can't get around the problem of the punctuation, uh, and English versions will differ. Notice verse 10, who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant who has walked in darkness with no glimmer of light, and so on. Now, how are we to punctuate that? Many English translations will punctuate it this way, who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant, question mark. And then the response to that, let him who has walked in darkness with no glimmer of light trust in the name of Yahweh and let him lean upon his God. That's a common way of taking it. But I suggest that the question mark should go after the word light. Because after the word servant, there is just the relative pronoun who. And the most natural connecting idea or term for that word who, that pronoun who, is the servant that has just been mentioned. And so the text should be translated, I'm convinced, this way. Who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant? Who has walked in darkness with no glimmer of light? Question mark. Then the response, let him trust in the name of Yahweh and let him lean upon his God. Now, how do you see something of the difference? So we went through it rather quickly. What I'm saying is that the one who walked in darkness with no glimmer of light is referring to the servant, He's referring to the one who has suffered, as it says in verses 5 and 6, and this is another way of expressing that. Now, it's interesting here, do you notice there in verse 10 what it implies about the servant figure? Notice how the first part of verse 10 puts two things almost seems on the same plane or at the, uh, the same level. Who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant? You see that? Fearing Yahweh, or the Lord, and obeying the voice of his servant are put on an equality, on the same level. That seems to be implying, at least indirectly, the deity of the servant. Okay? But then you have this amazing statement that the servant is the one who has walked in darkness with no glimmer of light. He himself knows what the darkness is like. So, you see how he's depicted here. Now, that means that you may say, sometimes in your despair, I'm severely tempted, I'm hated, and I'm maligned. But the servant can say, yes, I was despised and rejected by men. Or you may say that God has forsaken you, and the servant can say, Yes, there was a time when God forsook me, you know. He's been through the darkness. He's experienced it. And you know, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18, this experience of the servant of walking in darkness without any light can be the experience of a Christian believer. In that chapter, and you should look at it if you haven't for a while, in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18, it talks about, and especially in section 4, about a few ways, four different ways, that the assurance of a believer can be, well, unsettled, almost demolished. And it mentions several different ways. And one of the ways is by God's withdrawing the light of His countenance and suffering even those who fear Him to walk in darkness and have no light. It's allusion to Isaiah 50. Now in that case, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, when it talks about that instance, it's, it's saying it, this is not for any known sin. This is not for any necessary failure on your part as a believer. It's just a mysterious thing that sometimes happens. 
that God mysteriously may withdraw the light of His face and allow you to walk in darkness without any light like His servant. It can happen. My once I had a doctor when we were living in Tennessee, and I described a condition that I guess that I had. I can't even remember what it was. Uh, but but uh, Dr. Wagner's response was, it's not common, but it's not unusual. Now, that's sort of the way it is. Can it, can it be that that a believe that, that God would withdraw for some mysterious reason the light of his face and allow his servant to walk in darkness and he can't figure out why. Well, that's well documented in Christian biography if you haven't experienced it yourself. It's not common, but it's not unusual. But you see, if that's your experience, it has already been the servants. And he has walked through the darkness with no glimmer of light, and he knows the way through it. And you can lean on him. That's the sufferer, submissive to God's will. Now then notice, thirdly, that you have a picture of the believer sure of God's help. Verses 7 to 9, the servant is the believer, sure of God's help. Now, notice here that in spite of his suffering, he goes on believing, and that's an example to God's people. You see that expression of his faith in verse 7 and verse 9. But the Lord Yahweh helps me, verse 7. Again in verse 9, oh yes, the Lord Yahweh helps me. So there's the expression or the content of his faith. And notice the effect of that faith. You see in verse 7, the Lord Yahweh helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face as a flint, because he convinced that the Lord helps him. He goes on enduring. He does not give up in despair. But he says, therefore, I've set my face as a flint. I'm determined to go on. That setting my face as a flint really, I think, is behind Luke 9, verse 51 in the New Testament, where Luke says, their turn in the road came for Jesus when he set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Now, so this is the effect of his faith, this endurance. And notice especially this um, character of the defiance of his faith. Did you, did you catch that? Look, at, look especially at verses 8 and 9. My justifier is close by. Who dares bring a charge against me? Let us stand up in court together. Who is my prosecutor? Let him draw near to me. Oh, yes, the Lord Yahweh helps me. Who is the one who will declare me guilty? Surely all of them will wear out like a garment. Do you see the sense of defiance and buoyancy in that faith? Now, sometimes questions are like that. We tend to think of questions as expressing doubt or, or, uh, que or, or uh, uncertainty, but not always. Sometimes questions can be assertive, they can be affirmative, and, and they are here. It's as if he is, he is daring anyone to bring a, a, an accusation against him. And you notice the question, who dares bring a charge against me? Who is my prosecutor? Verse 8. Verse 9, who is the one who would declare me guilty? It's very much like Romans 8, 33 and 34, isn't it? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Uh, who will condemn, etc.? Now, I, actually, I think there are more questions in Romans 8 than usually. Uh, I think Donald Gray Barnhouse was right when I heard, I heard him expounding that when I was probably a teenager or college student, maybe, uh, uh, in, Roman, uh, in Romans 8, and he, he suggested that all those those words, those clauses in Romans 8, 33 and 34, for example, were questions. Now, that's not the way most English versions read. They read, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, as though that's a response to that question. And who is the one who will condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, was raised. 
But Barnhouse said, and other scholars take this position, and I am convinced of it as well, that these are all questioned because the, that from verse 31 on in Romans 8, it's a barrage of questions. And so we don't have the punctuation in the original text. Sometimes we have to divine it. And I think they're right. Barnhouse was right when he said the way you should read that is, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God? Who justifies? Question mark. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ Jesus, who died, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? Is he going to condemn? As if to say how ludicrous that would be. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God who justifies? Are you nuts? No, absolutely not. But they're all questions. And they're, they're, they're not raising doubts, are they? But they're they're asserting certainties. It's a defiant faith, and that's the way it is here. Questions do that sometimes. And uh, when we were in seminary, uh, there were, you know, as oftentimes in seminary, uh, fellows can be a little sarcastic, and uh, uh, several of my friends uh, had the practice of when someone asked a question, of responding with a question. And if the question that was asked, is the Pope Catholic? Like, obviously that's the case. Well, that's when a question can, can, can uh, express a certainty and that sort of thing. And that's what happens here in our text. Now, then I think the most important or vital thing to see at this point is the context of this faith. You see that faith of the servant in verses 7 through 9, but please remember the context, verses 5 to 6. When he says, the Lord Yahweh helps me, he says that in the face of scorn and darkness. He's not saying this while lounging poolside at a resort hotel in the Bahamas where he has gone on a cruise sponsored by a major evangelical organization. He is saying this in the midst of suffering and rejection and darkness. Sometimes context makes such a difference, doesn't it? There was a time when Calvin wrote in a letter and referred to the Lord and said, he is himself a father and knows what is best for his children. When you hear that, you say, well, that's very nicely put. I agree with that, etc. But it helps if you remember the context. Because, you see, it was after Calvin and his wife, Idolette, had lost their two-week-old son, Jacques, in death. And Calvin was writing, I think it was to his friend, Vere. And he said, the Lord has indeed inflicted a severe and bitter wound in the death of our infant son, but he is himself a father and knows what is best for his children. And when you hear it in that context, it packs a different punch, doesn't it? Or what about Alan Cameron, the covenanter? He's in a dungeon in Edinburgh, and he doesn't know uh, that his uh, son Richard has been killed in battle at Ayers Moss. Now, it was on this occasion, partly, that Alan Cameron picked up part of Psalm 23 and said that the Lord has made goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. But what's the context of that? Oh, well, you see, there was a trooper that came and opened the door of the dungeon and threw down the severed hands of his son Richard, and I think his head as well, and he said, hollered down to Alan Cameron, do you know whose these are? And Alan Cameron took those gory tokens on his knees and fondled them, and he said, yes, they are my sons my dear sons, good is the Lord who could never harm me nor mine and has made goodness and mercy to follow me 
all the days of my life. When you see and hear the context, it puts a special grip on those words. Now, I don't know the darkness you may be facing right now. Nevertheless, we're still called to the simple faith of the servant to say, the Lord Yahweh helps me. That may sound simplistic to you, but if the one who walked in darkness without any glimmer of light was able to say it, then it must be true. Now, what does God offer his people in their weariness and in their despondency? Only Jesus, Jesus the disciple, Jesus the sufferer, Jesus the believer, he is all you need. Now, our God and Father, give to us an anatomy of obedience. Give to us ears that hear your servant's word. Give to us backs and faces that are willing to suffer if need be. Give to us mouths that will continue to say, the Lord Yahweh helps me, even in the midst of darkness and despair. We pray in the servant's name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is O Sacred Head Now Wounded, a hymn that is attributed to Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the greatest of the medieval theologians, uh, translated then by the great German hymn writer Paul Gerhardt, and then translated by uh, James W. Alexander of the Alexander family that was so important to Princeton Seminary in its early years uh, into English. Uh, o sacred head now wounded. Mm -hmm.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.